I was never really in it for the money or the coke or the chicks, you know. I mean, I, I was in it for the art of, and, you know, when you're a musician, you have this passion in you, this hunger in you, not to be famous, but just to get on stage and express yourself, you know, to, to, to play. Boris Kinberg, I'm a percussionist with Willie, playing with him on and off for about 20 years. I'm Dave Keyes, bass player and vocalist with uh, Willie since uh, October of 92. My name is Freddy or Frederic Coella. And uh, what, a, what, what a pleasant evening. And I'm Kenny Margolis. I've been playing with Willie's. Uh, I started with Willie in 1979. I think it was the fall of fall of '79. That's sweet. Last time I checked, I don't remember. And I'm your daughter, which they call me Lisa because that's my middle name. When I joined, uh, he had a band that was the, I would say, the remnants of his first band that uh, uh, played on the first two records. And one by one, they either left or were replaced. And during this period, Willie was writing uh, the material that would become the uh, the Chat Blue album. I initially joined in uh, 1984. Uh, the sax player, original sax player, uh, Louis Cordelesi, who I had worked with in uh, other projects in New York. It was a core group of like 25, 30 guys that seemed to do all the bar gigs around town for various singer-songwriters. And he showed me a black and white photo of Louis rolling sax and Willie leaning into the microphone in James Brown style. And I just had never seen anybody who looked like this, especially when he was playing down at CBGB's. And I, I got a, a, a copy of the audition tape from Kenny Margolis, the original keyboard player. And I listened to it and I said, I'm meant to be in this band because this is what I do. So I auditioned for this band in New York City. There was uh, six or seven bass players there that day and a bunch of saxophone players. And uh, made the first audition and uh, Willie wasn't even there. The, the band was there and they were auditioning everybody. And They asked me to come back uh, the next day and uh, played a couple more songs, tried a few things. And then we settled in on a saxophone player, uh, Mario Cruz. <clears throat> and uh, then after two or three uh, rehearsal sessions, Willie came in, listened to uh, a couple of things, and then he came up to me and he said, uh, 
David, you want to go to Europe? I said, yeah, sounds good. And in a, a film that was done about the Ramones, I don't know whether or not you've seen that two-hour film. End of the century. Excellent movie, I, I think. They interview one of the Ramones and they talk about the starting and starting there, and they say, yeah, like uh, there was us, there was uh, you know, there was Blondie, and there was uh, this band Mink Deville, and they said we were the outcast bands of the outcast bands. On the absolute fringe, and you know, in Hilly, Hilly would. He let them play there. We were doing little Walter stuff. We were doing uh, Elmore James stuff. We weren't doing Backdoor Man, you know. We were doing like the real stuff, stuff nobody had heard. Uh, the only thing that we used to do that people had heard or recognized was we used to do Please, Please, Please by James Brown. We used to do our, our Apollo thing where, you know, you go down on the floor and, you know, and Ruben would put my leather jacket, out. I had a long leather coat, and he'd put it over my shoulders, and I'd walk off and then go back and boom on the floor again, you know, because I saw James when I was a kid, and I love that show, man. Um, anyway, we played CBGBs for like three years, and then all of a sudden the word got out, and and then came this this, word that to me where I come from is a bad word, punk. If you're a punk, that's somebody who picks a fight with you and never shows up. There were, to me, to my mind, there were three main uh, eras. The first era was the, what was, was the Lower East Side, skinny tie, purple shirt, like West Side Story, <coughs> right? Uh, Puerto Rican sharks, gang vibe. And then it transmuted into the Mississippi Riverboat, plantation, slash, gambler, riverboat, uh, road, uh, a Rhett Butler thing, where he had custom-made suits, and he really got into the period and into the, into the clothes, and it just totally immersed himself in the New Orleans, not in the present New Orleans, but the New Orleans of the 1880s, 1890s, the absence drinking, the food of New Orleans, you know, totally immersed himself in that. Well, we met him in, uh, in New Orleans. He was, I think, recording the uh, Victory Mixture album. And he needed some background vocals. And at the time, we had worked with a uh, big producer by the name of Alan Tucson. You know who Alan is. Yeah. Mr. Tucson. Don't you know Alan Tucson? Maybe my life. And then he left New Orleans, moved to the Southwest and came back as the second coming of Black Elk. There was uh, the Ramones, Patti Smith, television, uh, talking heads, and us. And I would say we were, we were the five big draws. Then one night this blonde-headed guy came in, you know, Ben Edmonds. And he really is the guy who's responsible for having, to being the visionary of seeing that we were different than they were and that we could probably have a career, you know, at like playing music. So we went into the studio. Um, they gave us like, I guess, a, you know, a couple of bucks. We went into this little cheap studio and we did, I think, uh, four songs. And he gave it to Jack Nietzsche. I didn't even know who Jack Nietzsche was. I could tell you who Billy Boy Arnold was or I could tell you who, uh, you know, uh, One String Sam was. But I couldn't tell you who Jack Nietzsche was, you know. I went up to a record store, and a friend of mine who is a record uh, junkie, uh, he works up there at Colony Records in Times Square, and I said, they, they want this guy, uh, his name is Jack Nietzsche, to, to produce the record. I said, have you ever heard of him? Knowing that he would know who this guy was. He said, are you kidding me? You don't know who he is? And I said, no, I never heard of him. He said, Jesus, he did uh, a lot of the Stone stuff. He did uh, a lot of Neil Young stuff. He did all that Phil Spector stuff that we grew up with and loved. 
He's a, he's a big wig. He's he's very very good. He came to New York. We got very very drunk, very drunk together, real drunk. We just fell in love with each other. You know, we we're just buddies to the end. You know, I lost Jack. I told you a story. He died on my birthday uh, four years ago. Uh, five years ago, actually. Um, and he was like, he was like my uncle, my crazy uncle. I called him my mentor and my tormentor. At that at, at that time, he, uh, he he was exerting. Uh, people knew who he was. I mean, it, fans and in the business, from my understanding. And Springsteen, in particular, drew a lot of inspiration from some of his tunes and his arrangements. So even you know, using things like the sax and. Right. The keyboard and that kind of thing. I mean, I don't know if this is true, but uh, I mean, Willie played uh, Bon Jovi's Wedding, <laughs> so he, within with, with, within his peers, he was he was definitely known and, and well respected. You, you just can't categorize the stuff that he does, you know, he's, and that's that's how he's very talented in that way because he does a mixture of everything. <laughs> I don't know if Willie's uh, spoken about this, about his uh, feel, you know, about his, his history with the, with the American uh, music uh, juggernaut. But he really doesn't have a lot of good things to say about it, has been my experience. Uh -huh. When he started out, first first record, he was on Capital, Capital, and well, we all know what happened to yeah, and the I think Beatles that might, on Capital. And, and it's not, and it's not, it's not without, it's not without uh, fault. On, on their side too, because they produced, uh, I think it was Savoir Fair, and Capital, they had it, and they didn't know what to do with it. Right. They what, had no. Where do we put this guy? Yeah. Well, how do we? How do we? How do we sell this guy? I don't think the American public had a chance to to experience him because in America at the time you had MTV telling you what to like, uh, whereas Europe had not had MTV at that point. And they were very open uh, to different music. The suits have remained the same. They're still, you know, it's. I now think of it as okay, you get married and you and your wife go to the bank and you're gonna get a loan for a house. Now, the bank don't really care if you and your wife don't get along and you get a divorce and all of the shit falls down on your, the ceiling falls down on your head. It's business, it's business. We're artists, so we take it real personal, you know, because it is our blood on those tapes. It sticks to the tape, matter of fact, you know. Jack said, man, I don't know why they even signed you. You should be with another label. He said, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're very safe. I mean, look who they got, the Beatles the Beach Boys, it's all very safe stuff. He said, they thought you were a bunch of criminals when they saw you guys come in, you know. And I, he was right, he was right. Uh, they backed me so far, but then when I went to do Le Chat Blue, which was the third record, uh, I knew they weren't gonna let me go to Paris by myself. They knew I was gonna get into trouble. Right, Capital in the US did not uh, know what to do with it because they perceived Willie as this punk rocker from CBGB's and uh, he came back with a very different record and uh, they didn't understand it. <laughs> they understood it in Europe. They released it immediately in Europe and everybody loved it. Anyway, as we move on and the records moved on and then I went to Atlantic Records and I was with Polydor, Polygram, Capital, Atlantic, all of them, you know, the suits, the suits, you know. Ahmed and I got along famously. We were, we were good buddies, but we never got anything done. I, uh, I consider my, uh, It was a very, very expensive education. It can cost you your life. Uh, 
okay? And also, you can look very foolish and very stupid. I mean, how many times have any of us been really, really drunk and acted like total asses? Total asses. I mean, I think my nose got this way. And I never want to fight now. But I think back then, Willie drew true inspiration from his lifestyle. You look yeah. at his songs, nobody, but nobody writes better songs about drugs. He is the master. And I've heard them all. And his are without a doubt the most poetic, lyrical, and romantic songs about stuff that can potentially kill you, or will kill you eventually. So I think he drew real inspiration from his dangerous lifestyle at that period because he was young and strong and, and, just, and it just poured out of him. Willie is the strongest person I've ever met. He went through all this, this, uh, this I don't know, you know, my, my English is, all this troubled time, you know, and uh, He's still here. He's still standing up and still singing like like amazing, you know. So he's he's a uber mensch, you know. He's, he's amazing. So I'm not saying like you know everybody uh, everybody who does uh, who does dope like that is going to write is going to write a, a song like uh, mixed up sugar girl or Spanish stroll or Lily's daddy's Cadillac, a brilliant song which I wish we do. Yeah. Lily's Daddy's Cadillac, it's a movie, a mini film. In a three minute song, you have an hour and a half film. Tells the whole story. Tells the whole story, brilliant. And what's it about? About a drug deal gone bad. When I was working with Knopfler, and Mark will testify to this, he comes over and we were gonna go over material that we were gonna do for the Miracle record. And, uh, so I played him the cassette, and he said, oh, you know about the movie I'm doing? And I said, no, what movie? You're doing a movie? Great, man, you're doing a soundtrack? He said, yeah. He said, this is too strange. You don't know about the movie? I said, no, I don't know about the movie. What movie? He said, well, Rob Reiner's doing this movie, and it's about a prince and a princess, and it's exactly what you wrote down here. The lyrics, the text is exactly the same story as the movie. I think he thinks, you know, I'm touched or something. What the thing about Willie for good or ill is that he comes on stage with the exact same attitude that he's had all day. There's absolutely no shift in his, in, in his perception of reality at that moment. It could be the stage or the street, and he'll come on with, with, with what happened during the day onto the stage. And sometimes that could work out, and sometimes it could be a little dicey, depending on his mood. <laughs> and he, and uh, you know, he's, I, 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 he's honest in the sense that he can't, he can't turn it off. Right? He just brings it with him, and uh, wh whatever happens, happens. But the fact that he, he shows, he's been, he comes to sound checks now, is, 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 is really different for us. You know, it's a focus. It's a focus, and if you lose that like focus for a second. The wine goes by, you've lost it, you know. And it's happened to me a thousand times, you know. One of the things I love about Willie's uh, decisions in the moment while we're on stage is that he's always looking for the odd bar or a little phrase extension, or he's not thinking of it that way, but he's just waiting for the right moment to go to the next line, even if the song doesn't go that way. And so we're always kind of paying attention make sure we all hit at the same time, but it keeps the music alive, you know? So every night, uh, each song is just a little bit different. You could see that he's having a great time on stage every night, and that's, that's so important. 
it's 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 been it has been an experience traveling with Willie. It really has. I mean, really, R- Willie is a wonderful person. He really is. I mean, you don't you don't get any. I mean, Willie is just like he's a sweetheart. He's a total sweetheart. I don't care. He's easy to work with. He's very easy to work with. He doesn't play the boss role. Right. Totally. Even when he should. He gets away from that. Even when he should. He just, he doesn't, he does not like to do that. And when Willie called me now, this was the right time to, uh, to start again with him. Now he's, he's amazing. I mean, I'm, I'm quite fascinated how good he's doing now. It's, it's, it's mind boggling. I mean, he's playing like great, he's singing great, it's, it's like, who, who is this guy? You know, it's like he finally landed, you know? And, and now we finally can share everything together, you know? And, and it's, it's really cool. And when, he, and when he sounds great, the band sounds great. Yeah. I'd like to thank him for that. When he, he's been sounding so good, the band sounds different, even though it's basically the same material. The band sounds strong and full and confident. It's a pleasure. You know, it's been a real pleasure this time now. My my aspiration is really. Uh, I hope it, it, if if uh, if I do if I was born under a lucky star, I'd like to make it to like you know where Muddy Waters was at, you know, and be able to stand up there without leotards on at like, you know, 70 years old and play with just that kind of feeling and that kind of passion. That is what I aspire to, you know. That would be one of the most wonderful things. One thing, Willie, get a haircut. That's it. Get a haircut. <laughs> Go here. Drag your face down there, get a haircut. <laughs> See you later. We all have our friends.